Shri Shri Guru Garanga Shri Shri Gandharvika Giri Hari Ju Ki Jai Jai Om Gyanam Timanandasya Gyanam Jana Shilakaya Chakshurun Alitam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kalpatrubhya Scha Kripa Sindhu Veva Cha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha So we're continuing to read the Krishna book, and I want to mention something again that we uh, discussed yesterday. Uh, Rukmini, when she sent a message with uh, the Brahmin to Krishna, <coughs> part of the message she was sending was she, she wanted Krishna to kidnap her, to come and steal her and uh, take her as his wife. And she knew that that would mean a fight with Shishupal and her brother Rukmi also. And, uh, but she didn't want to inhibit Krishna. So she told Krishna, she told the Brahmin messenger, tell Krishna, don't worry if any of my friends or family get killed or wounded, if you have to fight to, uh, during the process of kidnapping me. So, this is a sort of position we are trying to understand, accommodate, and follow. That in the service to the Lord, in service to our Lord, Sri Krishna, then he is everything. And as the cowherd boys and the gopis, the cowherd girls, uh, were willing to take all risks for Krishna, the service of Sri Krishna, then uh, we should also have that type of attitude that all risk we are willing to accept on his, in, uh, in his service. On our own behalf, we shouldn't have any interest. Our personal safety or even our family and friends. Krishna's interest is first, and guru, repre guru represents Krishna, or Krishna is uh, manifests himself as Guru. Who we see as Guru, who is Guru, is uh, the representation of Krishna divinity, his full-fledged uh, representation in the form available to us that he can direct just as Krishna directed Arjuna so our guru offers the direction of Krishna to us uh, in a form that is available to us we are too far away from Krishna to um, comprehend, understand uh, have direct touch with him as Arjuna did Arjuna's position is very high. We are conditioned souls. Arjuna was showing himself as a conditioned soul, but he was not really a conditioned soul. That was his posture, his real position as eternal friend of Krishna. So, 
we aspire for such a position. But in our present state, as conditioned souls, condition means under the influence of maya, the illusory energy, then Krishna is very far away, but guru is very close. And so Krishna comes as a guru to help us, to give us direction. So as we will follow Krishna's direction, regardless of our friend or family, in other words, we will serve Krishna without consideration of The uh, results are the yeah, the results of that service. What may occur as a result of that service? We may lose everything, or we may gain everything. Arjuna was afraid he would lose his friends and family, so he didn't want to serve Krishna's desire. But Rukmini says, "I don't care for my friends and family. I care for you. I want to serve your lotus feet." She wanted Krishna as her husband to serve his lotus feet, to serve him, to take shelter of him. She accepted Krishna as Lord, her master, and she wanted to serve him. So, uh, in consideration of that service, nothing else is, uh, uh, has any real value. So, her idea was such that even my friends and family, and naturally friends and family are very dear, but even my friends and family, she said, oh, if they get killed or wounded, don't worry about it. Don't even think about it. Just come and get me. <laughs> Just come and get me, Krishna. Take me. That's what we want. That's a very nice idea of Sri Rukmini Devi. So same for Gurudev. What you do with me, do as you like with me. But you are my Lord, you are my Master. Let me serve you. And whatever happens in the environment and the surroundings, as a result of that service, let it be. I don't care for that. My devotion is to you. Okay, so the Brahmin is the messenger has delivered Rukmini's message to Krishna. And now we're on chapter 53 of Krishna book. And uh, this chapter is entitled Krishna Kidnaps Rukmini. After hearing Rukmini's statement, so Krishna heard the, the Brahmin went to Krishna. Oh, and another thing is so nice when this uh, Brahmin uh, arrived at Krishna's palace, Krishna worshipped the Brahmin. Reaching the gate of Dwarka, the Brahmin informed the doorkeeper of his arrival, and the doorkeeper led him to the place where Krishna was sitting on a golden throne. Since the Brahmin had the opportunity to be Rukmini's messenger, he was fortunate enough to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, the original cause of all causes. So again, if we are fortunate enough to serve a devotee of the Lord. The Brahmin's qualification was that he had the opportunity to be Rukmini's messenger. So Rukmini is a great devotee of Krishna and as a result even her messenger got the darshan of Krishna. Messenger is not such a big position, not a big position. Rukmini had position to capture Krishna's affection so much that he is willing to come and kidnap her and uh, take her as his wife, forcibly take her, to fulfill her desire. 
but she had a Brahmin, sent a Brahmin as a messenger, and the Brahmin also got the darshan of Krishna, simply by being her messenger. A Brahmin is the spiritual teacher of all the social divisions. Lord Krishna, in order to teach everyone the Vedic etiquette of how to respect a Brahmin, immediately got up and offered him his throne. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, sitting on his throne, got up and offered it to the Brahmin. So therefore, one of the opulences of Krishna is renunciation. He has six opulences. Uh, renunciation is one of those opulences. So he is not uh, uh, showing any attachment to uh, the position of king or uh, the, or even the, or the supreme personality of Godhead or whatever position one may uh, give for him sitting on a golden throne Krishna renounces golden throne and give it gave it to the Brahman he's not, he's not interested in that. He offered, his, he offered the Brahman, he immediately got up and offered the Brahman his throne. When the Brahman was seated on the golden throne, Lord Sri Krishna began to worship him exactly as the demigods worship Krishna. In this way he taught everyone that worshiping his devotee is more valuable than worshiping him. So, I just mentioned that the guru, he comes, it is Krishna coming in the form that is available to us, who we can interact with. We can interact with the guru, but Krishna is so distant from us, so far from us, that other than that via media to him, the guru, and, and the Vaishnava, then it's very difficult to have any transaction with Krishna. So, through the Guru, through the Vaishnava, that, that is possible. Then Krishna is showing here by his worshipping of, of this Brahman, who is also his devotee, and he taught everyone that worshipping his devotee is more valuable than worshipping him. So we must always remember that. Okay, so... Um, after hearing Rukmini's statement, Lord Krishna was much ple very much pleased. He immediately shook hands with the Brahmin and said, My dear Brahmin, <laughs> shook hands with the Brahmin. My dear Brahmin, I'm very glad to hear that Rukmini is eager to marry me, since I am also eager to get her hand. My mind is always absorbed in thoughts of the daughter of Bhishmaka, and sometimes I cannot sleep at night because I am thinking of her. I can understand that the marriage of Rukmini with Shishupal has been arranged by her elder brother in a spirit of animosity towards me. So I am determined to give a good lesson to all of these princes. Just as one extracts and uses fire after manipulating ordinary wood, after dealing with these demoniac princes, I shall bring forth Rukmini like fire from their midst. Krishna, upon being informed of the specific date of Rukmini's marriage, was anxious to leave immediately. He asked his driver, Daruka, to harness the horses for his chariot and prepare to go to the kingdom of Vidarbha. After hearing this order, the driver brought Krishna's four special horses. The names and descriptions of these horses are mentioned in the Padma Purana. The first one, Shaibya, was greenish. The second, Sugriva, was grayish like ice. The, fir, the third, Megha Pushpa, was the color of a new cloud, and the last, Balahaka, was of ashen color. 
When the horses were yoked and the chariot was ready to go, Krishna helped the Brahmin up and gave him a seat by his side. Immediately they started from Dwarka and within one night arrived at the province of the Darbha. So we are so fortunate by the grace of Sri Shukadeva and Sri Vyasadeva to hear these intimate pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Imagine. God's pastimes are being described and we are able to hear those by the grace of the Acharyas. Where is the religion that gives such description of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? So intricate. Oh, the horses, they are this color. Uh, green, gray, the color of a new cloud, ashen color. These are the names of the horses. Sugriva, um, Saibya, Sugriva, Megha Pushpa, and Balahaka. Those are the... So not only do we hear how uh, the descriptions of Krishna's form, his color, his descriptions of his face, his ears, his arms, his legs, his belly, his chest. All these things are described in the, in the Puranas. Where is such a description of God? Everyone else is left mystified. Oh, God could be this, God could be that. We think God is this. Speculate, speculate, speculate. But the Vaishnavas don't have to speculate here. Here is God. Here is God. There, these are his horses. This is his palace. This is where he lives. These are his friends. This, these are his wives. These are his girlfriends. This is his mother. This is his father. Everything. Not everything. It's un, he's unlimited. So it can't be everything. That's, that's not going to come through the, the book in this way. But everything can be known because everyone can know him if one simply has the sincere desire to know him. And to know him, then, sincere de desire to know him means first sincere desire to serve him, and sincere desire to serve him means sincerely serve Guru and Vaishnava. Through service of Guru and Vaishnava, then we will uh, see everything that we can see about Krishna as he reveals himself to us. The name of the city, huh? all these things, everything, so much detail. The kingdom of Dwarka is situated in the western part of India and the Darbha is situated in the northern part. They are separated by a distance of not less than 1,000 miles. But the horses were so fast that they reached their destination, a, cow, a town called Kundina, within one night, or at most 12 hours. 1,000 miles in 12 hours by chariot. Mm -hmm. Pretty fast horses. <laughs> If it was 10 hours, that would be hundred average speed of 100 miles an hour. And he may have stopped to have some, some, uh, some boga, right? May have stopped for lunch, dinner, uh, snack or something. So uh, within one night or at most 12 hours. And you can't, and there's no, there's no uh, highway in the United States where you can travel a thousand miles at an average speed of a hundred miles an hour because it would be illegal, even if you had a car that could do it. <laughs> but by chariot and four horses, Krishna was able to do it. They must have had fairly good roads also.
King Bhishmaka was not enthusiastic about handing his daughter over to Shishupal, but he was obliged to accept the marriage settlement due to his affectionate attachment for his eldest son, who had negotiated it. I remember the name of his eldest son? Rukmi. Rukmini, the daughter, and Rukmi, the son. As a matter of duty, the king was decorating the city for the marriage ceremony and acting in great earnestness to make it very successful. Could you open this? As a matter of duty, the king was decorating the city for the marriage ceremony and acting in great earnestness to make it very successful. Water was sprinkled all over the streets and the city was cleansed very nicely. Since India is situated in the tropical zone, the atmosphere is always dry. Dust always accumulates on the streets and roads, so they must be sprinkled with water at least once a day. And in big cities like Calcutta, twice a day. The roads of Kundina were arrayed with colored flags and festoons, and gates were constructed at particular crossings. And even today in India, very uh, every morning you'll see shopkeepers throwing water, and, and householders also throwing water out on the sidewalks in front of their house, uh, sprinkling the sidewalks with water, the pathways with water. Uh, he, uh, he, not even, uh, not even sidewalks, concrete or asphalt sidewalks. In the villages also, just the pathways are sprinkled with water. So this has been custom for a long time, and still going on. The roads. Oh, <laughs> and I heard another interesting thing. Shila Prabhupada was talking about. Uh, how the spiritual leaders of India, we're talking about mentioning the Brahmins here, so he was talking about the spiritual leaders of India, the Brahmins, they had uh, failed the conditioned souls. They had not done their job properly to the conditioned souls. And he mentioned that, that because they had uh, not given any provision for Muslims to be accepted in the society of Brahmins and Vaishnavas, that therefore uh, the religious leaders had done a great disservice to the Vedic culture, and that the Vedic culture would be spoiled by these discriminatory practices based on material consideration. So spiritual consideration is described, and not even spiritual, but just common sense, Describe Chatur Varnyam Mayashrashtam that the one should uh, the social classes and the and the, the ashrams, the spiritual uh, status, are not determined by birth, never determined by birth. It's ludicrous to think such a thing. Especially in Kali Yuga, then everyone is Shudra, Kalo Shudra Sambhava, everyone is born Shudra. So then uh, by one's birth it will be decided he is Brahman, he is Vaishya, he is whatever. No, not by birth. And so Gurudev said about Leela Sundri Devi, she is, she is my real daughter, <laughs> spiritual daughter. He said at least, he said she is a, a Vaishnava, she is a devotee, but she is my daughter. But he didn't consider by birth, who is daughter, by service, spiritual qualification, dedication, etc., initiation also, many things. But who is following the Guru, then they are accepted as his family. So 
our, our family is spiritual family, and, uh, and that should always be the consideration. So, we are not discriminating against anyone by birth, by qualification. That should be the consideration. So, whether, so Prabhupada named, uh, named uh, termed, described his disciples as Yovanas, his Western disciples, Yovana. Yovana means lower than Mlecha, or lower, lower than Shudra, Yovana, Mlecha, same thing. Lower than Shudra, dog eater. He's told in one one recording, and the Orient, and he has seen. Actually, they are still practicing this. They still have this practice of dog eating, eating dog. They are that is considered very low. Who will eat the dog? And that is considered very low. Killing the cow is worse than killing a dog. But who will eat the flesh of the dog? And that is a very low sort of culture. But they are not disqualified from becoming praiseworthy. Who becomes a servant of Krishna is worshipped, worshipable. So even Krishna may worship his devotee. His position of devotee is so exalted. So the spiritual leaders of India did a great disservice and Srila Prabhupada said as if you don't accept his disciples who have shown themselves by qualification as being Brahman and Vaishnava then the Vedic culture will be lost and you will be the cause of it. Because the Vedic culture will be lost if you can't accept Brahman by qualification, only Brahman by birth. And then he described that at one time, he said by historical, his understanding of historical accounts of history, at one time, Bharata Bhumi Te Hoyla Manusha Janmajar, that the all Bharat Varsha meant all the whole earth was Bharat Varsha. One, uh, one uh, continent, one culture, Vedic culture was prominent throughout the whole earth. He said, but gradually, just like this partition now, he said, you wanted to separate the Muslims. You didn't want to give them a chance to uh, become recognized as members of the higher status. And as a result, he said, now India is partitioned. And now you have Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. So in this way, India keeps getting smaller and smaller. So he said, originally, everything was India. Everything was Bard Varsha. But it got segregated because the culture, the Vedic culture was uh, um, segregated. Those who accepted real Vedic culture, Chatur Varnyang Maya Shrestam, the one's qualification by one's uh, status by qualification, not by birth. But, because, but those who wanted to ignore that, then gradually they broke off uh, and established those mundane systems separate from the Vedic culture. And so India got smaller and smaller. The Vedic, India means the heart where the Vedic culture is being practiced. That got smaller and smaller. And he said, so now the, you've uh, ignored the Muslims and you've um, disgraced, you've uh, made them, uh, uh, given them a position from which they cannot uh, redeem themselves. And so they did what you can expect them to do. They started their own country. Of course. Why not? So well, now they're separate. So Pakistan now separate from India. Bangladesh separate from India. And what do they make it? They tried to make it all Muslim dominated. 
better that they had a, a, a way to uh, show themselves uh, that not by birth that we are mlecha, and not by birth that you are Brahman, but by quality. So, Shudra, Mlecha, anyone can become Brahman or more than Brahman. He can become Vaishnava if he follows the system, the practical system which Krishna gives for becoming a Brahman or being, yes, being a Brahman, becoming a Brahman, becoming a Vaishnava. It's not by birth, by qualification. Anyone can be, practice Krishna consciousness and become more than a Brahman. <coughs> Simply follow the uh, procedures outlined by our gurus. You will get the highest position, not only in the material world, but in the spiritual world. And no need to segregate everyone by these material standards. Well, everyone who wants to practice Krishna consciousness, then welcome. Yes, come and practice. Join with us. The roads of uh, so so we 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 see the remnants of Vedic culture still today in India, in the in the villages. I was just saying, and actually not only in India, in Pakistan also, in Afghanistan. The Muslims are also uh, uh, following to a great extent the Vedic culture in different traditions. When I, uh, I was watching some documentary about uh, the uh, American soldiers, I don't know, documentary news or something, American soldiers fighting in Afghanistan, and they were showing how they were uh, trying to make friends with the, with the native people, with the village, going to the villages, and, and, the, and they're all, it's all Muslim, it's, you know, 99% or so, 98% Muslim, and they're uh, many places trying to follow the Muslim law of Sharia, and uh, and uh, they, part of that, depending on how it's followed, then they may persecute everyone else. Um, I think, every, every, like, like the Brahmins think no one else is worthy, then the, the Muslims think no one else is worthy. Everyone has to be subjugated uh, by the, the Muslims, so the Jews, the Christians, whoever, they're all supposed to be the subjects of the Muslims, and the Muslims will control by force, by coercion, by threat, by intimidation, by uh, so many terrorism, so many things. And the Brahmins do the same thing with, you know, more subtle means, or the Hindus, that, that this partition that took place, took place because of the fighting between the Hindus and the Muslims. The Hindus couldn't tolerate the Muslims. The Muslims couldn't tolerate the Hindus. They got two diff three different countries as a result. And Prabhupada blames the Hindus for this happening. You religious leaders, you didn't give a way to, for one to be promoted to the higher position. So they did what, what, you can exp what is natural for them to do. Okay. We have our own country, and we'll make the rules there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the religious Muslims, I was, I was very impressed to see one after another use an expression, something like this. Uh, uh, they, they say Allah, because they recognize Allah as God, but they say, um, the soldiers will say to them, um, we want you to do so and so, will you agree to that? Yes, yes, we will do it, Allah willing, God willing. Uh, so, uh, one after another, God willing, God willing, God willing. And at least they recognize that everything is happening by God's will. They're giving recognition to that. 
know, we should also so, uh, show that example. Everything is by God's will. That is Vaishnavism. What God wills, that will be done. We are his instruments. Yes, we can make our plans. They will be successful if God is willing. If he is willing. Ah, well, that's Vedic culture. The roads of Kundina were arrayed with colored flags and festoons. The gates were constructed at particular crossings. The whole city was decorated very nicely. The beauty of the city was enhanced by the inhabitants, both men and women, who were dressed in fresh washed clothes <clears throat> and decorated with sandalwood pulp, pearl necklaces, and flower garlands. Incense burned everywhere, and fragrances like a guru scented the air. Priests and brahmanas were sumptuously fed, and according to Vedic ritualistic ceremonies, were given sufficient wealth and cows in charity. In this way, they were engaged in chanting Vedic hymns. The king's daughter, Rukmini, was exquisitely beautiful. She was very clean and had beautiful teeth. The auspicious sacred thread was tied on her waist. She was given various types of jewelry to wear and long silken cloth to cover the upper and lower parts of her body. Learned priests gave her protection by chanting mantras from the Sama Veda, Rig Veda, and Yajur Veda. Then they chanted mantras from the Atarva Veda and offered oblations in the fire to pacify the influence of different stars. King Bhishmaka was experienced in dealing with Brahmins and priests when such ceremonies were held. He specifically honored the Brahmins by giving them large quantities of gold and silver, grain mixed with molasses, and cows decorated with cloth and ornaments. Damagosh, Shishupal's father, executed all kinds of ritualistic performances to invoke good fortune for his son. Shishupal's father was known as Damagosh due to his superior ability to cut down unregulated citizens. Dhamma means curbing down and Gosh means famous, so he was famous for controlling the citizens. In other words, there were no rascals in his kingdom, except his son who didn't like Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> but there are no the, the, the thievery, the stealing and uh, disruptions of uh, society uh, he curbed that he put it down Damagosh Damagosh thought that if Krishna came to disturb the marriage ceremony he would certainly cut him down with his military power so he was also even Krishna is not going to cause a disturbance in my kingdom <laughs> Therefore, after performing the various auspicious ceremonies, Damagosh gathered his military divisions. He took many elephants garlanded with golden necklaces and many similarly decorated chariots and horses. It appeared that Damagosh, along with his son and other, and other companions, was going to Kundina not exactly to get Shishupal married, but mainly to fight. So he had some idea that Krishna will come and try to take Rukmini, so we'll have to stop him with our military. When King Bhishmaka learned that Damagosh and his party were arriving, he left the city to receive them. Outside the city gate were many gardens where guests were welcome to stay. In the Vedic system of marriage, the bride's father receives the large party of the bridegroom and accommodates them in a suitable place for two or three days 
until the marriage ceremony is performed. The party led by Dhamma Ghosh contained thousands of men, among whom the prominent kings and personalities were Jara Sangda, Danta Vakra, Vidhurata, and Pondraka. It was an open secret that Rukmini was meant to be married to Krishna, but that her elder brother Rukmi had arranged her marriage to Shishupal. So her father, uh, Rukmini's father, Bhishmaka, uh, he couldn't uh, help it, to, uh, help it, help but let it be known that he wanted his daughter married to Krishna. <coughs> but anyway, Rukmi and Shishupal interfered and uh, so Shishupal's father, Damagosh, was aware that uh, there was an interest that Rukmi, Rukmini's interest was to marry Krishna and so he thought something could happen here. <laughs> Something's happening here. There was also some whispering about a rumor that Rukmini had sent a messenger to Krishna. Therefore, the soldiers suspected that Krishna might cause a disturbance by attempting to kidnap Rukmini. And we mustn't have disturbance. <laughs> Peace is above everything. Peace at all cost. That's what we want. No disturbance. They thought that, oh, Krishna might cause a disturbance. Go Shabani. Attempting to kidnap Rukmini. Even though they were not, even though they were not without fear, meaning, they, meaning that they had fear, they were all prepared to give Krishna a good fight to prevent the girl from being taken away. Sri Balaram received the news that Krishna had left for Kundina, accompanied only by a Brahmin, and that Shishupal was there with a large number of soldiers. Balaram suspected that they would attack Krishna, and thus, out of great affection for his brother, he took strong military divisions of chariots, infantry, horses, and elephants and went to the precincts of Kundina. So today this would mean thousands of infantry, tanks, artillery, <laughs> etc., mortars, cannon. So, and oh, each side is. This, this is the marriage ceremony, <laughs> preparing for the marriage ceremony. <laughs> like the, the, the battle for, uh, uh, what was it, um, the first Gulf War? Mm -hmm. um, what's his, uh, Saddam Hussein arranging all his forces uh, oh. in, the, in the desert. Uh, now, it's, now I don't even remember what what was the city that they had uh, the country they had invaded remember <laughs> what was it uh, anyway so Saddam Hussein invaded a country and then he got news heard some rumors of the United States and some other a bunch of other countries England and so many others 30 something countries were getting ready to attack so he assembled all of his forces, right, arranged them to be prepared for it, whatever might come. The United States, they uh, assembled their, their forces, infantry, tanks, missiles, airplanes, so many things. And Saddam Hussein, we're ready for you. They'll be the mother of all battles, right? 
He, he was sure the United States, oh, your, your people, they're a bunch of cowards. And the, when the real time for fighting comes, they, they'll just run away. My, my, my forces, I'm unlimitedly powerful. And uh, practically he was. He had the largest military, or one of the largest military, maybe third largest in the world, something like that, after the United States and maybe Russia or something. So Saddam Hussein was very confident. I cannot be defeated. I have thousands and thousands of uh, soldiers and infantry, tanks, thousand, thousand, more than a thousand uh, tanks, huge number of tanks, and so many things. So if the United States comes, then their blood will flow like rivers. Meanwhile, inside the palace, Rukmini was expecting Krishna to arrive. But when neither he nor the Brahmin who took her message appeared, she was full of anxiety and began to think how unfortunate she was. So now she's, in, she's speaking or thinking. There is only one night between today and my marriage day, and still neither the Brahman nor Shamasundar has returned. I cannot ascertain any reason for this. Having little hope, she thought that perhaps Krishna had found reason to become dissatisfied and had rejected her fair proposal. As a result, the Brahman might have become disappointed and not come back. Although she was thinking of various causes for the delay, she expected them both at any moment. She was hopeless and hopeful at the same time. Krishna is rejecting me or Krishna is accepting me? I hope, I hope he is accepting me and he will come and save me. But maybe he is not accepting me, he won't come. This is the anxiety a devotee is always feeling. I'm trying to serve, but my service is it being accepted? Is my service properly done and acceptable to the Lord? Or there's some defect? So that's great anxiety, always great anxiety for the devotee. My service, I'm trying to serve my Lord. But will it be acceptable? Is he accepting? Is it properly done? Maybe not. Sorry, great anxiety. You won't appreciate what I'm trying to do. I'm trying, but I'm deficient. I can't serve properly. <clears throat> Rukmini further thought that demigods such as Lord Brahma and Shiva and Goddess Durga might have been displeased. It is generally said that the demigods become angry when not properly worshipped. For instance, when Indra found that the inhabitants of Vrindavan were not worshipping him, Krishna having stopped the Indra Yajna, he became angry and wanted to chastise them. Thus Rukmini thought, in other words, Indra, not being properly worshipped, thought he would chastise the residents of Vrindavan who were, had uh, ignored him. Thus Rukmini thought that since she did not worship Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma very much, they might have become angry and tried to frustrate her plan. Similarly, she thought that Goddess Durga, the wife of Lord Shiva, might have taken the side of her husband. Lord Shiva is known as Rudra, and his wife is known as Rudrani. Rudrani and Rudra refer to those who are accustomed to putting others in distress to cry forever. Rukmini was thinking of Goddess Durga as Giriraj, Giriraja. Rukmini was thinking of Goddess Durga as Giri. Oh, I'm sorry, not Giri Raj. 
Giri Ja, Giri Ja. Rukmini was thinking of goddess Durga as Giri Ja, the daughter of the Himalayan mountains. Oh, well, Giri Raja is the sun. The Himalayan mountains are very cold and hard, and she thought of goddess Durga as hard-hearted and cold. In her anxiety to see Krishna, Rukmini, who was, after all, still a child, thought this way about the different demigods. The gopis worshipped goddess Katyayani to get Krishna as, her, as their husband. Similarly, Rukmini was thinking of the various types of demigods, not for material benefit, but in respect to Krishna. Praying to the demigods to achieve the favor of Krishna is not irregular, and Rukmini was fully absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. So devotees are cautioned not to worship the demigods because the demigods can only give benefit that Krishna is giving. So not to worship the demigods for some material benediction. But uh, Prabhupada is pointing out here that uh, worship of the demigods not for material profit but in service to Krishna, in respect to Krishna. Praying to the demigods to achieve the favor of Krishna is not irregular. And Rukmini was fully absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. Even though she pacified herself by thinking that the time for Govinda to arrive had not yet expired, Rukmini felt that she was hoping against hope. There was still time, but that time is short. There's still time for Krishna to arrive, but that time is getting shorter and shorter, and she's becoming more and more anxious. This is uh, Vipralamba. Become anxious that uh, I will not get uh, the service of the Lord. Not expressing her mind to anyone, she sh simply shed tears, unobserved by others. And when her tears became more forceful, she closed her eyes in help hopeless helplessness. When Rukmini was in such deep thought, auspicious, auspicious symptoms appeared in different parts of her body. Trembling began to occur <coughs> in her left eyelid, arm, and thigh. When trembling occurs in these parts of the body, it is an auspicious sign <clears throat> indicating that something lucrative can be expected. Something good can be expected. Just then, Rukmini, full of anxiety, saw the Brahmin messenger. Krishna, being the super soul of all living beings, could understand Rukmini's anxiety. Therefore, he sent the Brahmin inside the palace to let her know that he had arrived. When Rukmini saw the Brahman, she could understand the auspicious trembling of her body and immediately became elated. She smiled and inquired whether Krishna had already come. The Brahman replied that the son of the Yadu dynasty, Sri Krishna, had arrived. Krishna is in the house! <laughs> he had already arrived. He further encouraged her by saying that Krishna had promised to carry her away without fail. Rukmini was so elated by the Brahmin's message <clears throat> that she wanted to give him in charity everything she possessed. However, finding nothing suitable for presentation, she, sim she simply offered him her respectful obeisances. The significance of offering respectful obeisances to a superior is that one offering obeisances is obliged to the respected person. In other words, Rukmini implied that she would remain ever grateful to the Brahman. Anyone who gets the favor of the goddess of fortune, as did this Brahman, 
is without a doubt always happy in material opulence. So Rukmini is counted as one of the goddesses of fortune. She is offering her obeisances to the Brahman, and Prabhupada uh, points out that this means that uh, she is not only showing respect, but that she is obliged to him. Anyone who gets the favor this, of the goddess of fortune, <coughs> as did this Brahman, is without a doubt always happy in material opulence. Okay, we'll stop there for today. Any questions? Hmm. Yeah. Dharma's <coughs> Parikar, Sri Sri Guru Garanga, Sri Sri Gandharvika, Giridhari Ju Ki Jai. Jai. Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Srila Bhakti Sundar Govinda Dev Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Srila Bhakti Rakak Sridhar Dev Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Srila Esi Bhakti Vedanta Sami Maharaj Prabhupada, author of Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Ki Jai. Nitai Gaur Premanande Haribo. Hey, would you press that button again?